And ladies and gentlemen, it's time once again to bring in Arthur Schwartz. Good morning and Happy New Year, Arthur. Happy New Year to you, Shana Tova. Shana Tova, there we go. So, now, is it raining in New York? So did you have your apples and honey last night? <laughs> I did not have my apples and honey that last night. That was our dessert. <laughs> we did not have a, I confess, we did not have a Rosh Hashanah meal, although uh, it was a festive meal, <laughs> <laughs> ending with an apple cut up in some honey. But you didn't have the traditional, uh, the traditional meal. I don't know. There is a traditional. Meal. Yeah, I don't, I don't think know. So. What, in your family, what was the traditional meal for Rosh Hashanah? Uh, I I forget because it was every other year. Because of course, <laughs> we had uh, a Catholic side of the well, family you know, and a Jewish side of the family. I would say that most families, most Jewish Ashkenazi—that means European um, Jewish families—in uh, America make brisket, make a a, a, a large piece of meat. Although there's no re- on Passover, you ha- you're not supposed to have roasted meat, so a braised piece of meat is perfect. However, on Rosh Hashanah, you're allowed to eat. You know, the tradition is you can have roasted meat. So I don't know. People have roast chicken, roast turkey. Uh, rib is is a kosher cut, so you can have a prime rib. I'm going much more modest today. This is not what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to talk about something way thriftier than a festive meal, although for me it has become festive. I somehow happened across this recipe that ran in the New York Times four years ago, a recipe from a Korean-American chef who grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, His name is Roy Choi, and he is credited with creating the, uh, uh, let's put it, um, I hate the word gourmet, but I'm going to use it here in quotes, the gourmet food truck. He made Korean tacos. <laughs> very, very L.A., right? Although there's a place here in Brooklyn that makes a Korean taco place here in Brooklyn. But anyway, he, he, he's credited with, with a lot of stuff. And in fact, he's quite accomplished. He proves uh, he went to the Culinary Institute of America, even though he grew up on the West Coast. And uh, he proves the point, my point, that um, he was, he would, let me just add, that he was a very troubled youth um, who ended up in culinary school. That most, because his family was very affluent and they could afford to send him to culinary school. But I would say that a lot of chefs are academically challenged. In any case, they're people who don't really like to study, and they become chefs. This does not mean they're not smart. The really smart ones end up becoming entrepreneurs, restaurateurs, owning multiple businesses, and being the the inspiration for other chefs that they hire to create food, maybe to recreate their food, whatever the case may be. There are many different uh, cases here. David Chang is a great example of this. David Chang, another Korean American, um, who opened up a, a noodle bar here in Manhattan and now is an international restaurateur with the TV program and blah, blah. He, by the way, the TV program is on, on, on Netflix. It's called Ugly Delicious, and I highly recommend that each episode is about a different food. You know, we have but a noodle. Back to Roy Choi, pardon me? We have a noodle bar that just opened up here. You did? Good. Well, noodles in soup is a big deal thing these days. There are ramen places all over America, I'm sure, in Sharon, too. Uh, that's what this place is. Or it could be Chinese noodles in soup. In fact, the thing I love is that we, we go to a Chinese roast shop that also makes delicious broth in which they put the most delicate wontons. I mean, these are, the skins are really, really thin. In any case, back to Roy Choi. So I ran across this recipe online, and you take, it, it was Roy Choi's comfort food when he was a boy. This is what his uh, Korean-born mother uh, and raised mother used to make for him uh, as a snack, I guess, you know, for anything. As he says, it was my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. 
So it's you take a package of ramen, you know, the instant ramen. Now, when I went to look for this in the supermarket, I found a, I just happened over a brand called Nissin, N-I-S-S-I-N. It ends up that was the original instant ramen. It's I think it's at least 80 or years ago, you know, maybe even close to 100 years ago, invented by a Japanese guy. These dried noodles that come in a, in a cellophane bag with what they call a flavor. Oh, his name was Momo. It's on the back of the package. His name was Momofuku Fuku Ando, and he invented them. Well, actually, I was wrong. It's 1958. He created chicken ramen in Japan. And so this is this Nissin brand, which I got five for a dollar. That's 20 cents a package. Um, had no added MSG, which is the reason I bought it, because Mr. Harned claims he gets headaches from, I'm saying claims because this is not proven, that he gets headaches from <laughs> MSG. Um, but anyway, it is called the original Nissin Top Ramen. I bought the chicken flavor. And what Roy Choi does with it... Um, you throw away the packet, right? No, I didn't throw away the packet. Huh. Well, I mean, then you just have boiled noodles, right? But I use my own chicken broth. And then you add it to your own chicken broth. Yeah. Well, yeah, if you have good chicken broth in the house, I would do it. But let me tell you how this is, gets enhanced. Huh. It, you would never know that it was with that flavor. The flavoring packet is largely salt and chicken flavor. Um, this one doesn't have any MSG in it. So you boil up the noodles. Uh, you, you bring two cups of water. To, to, you're going to be amazed at what I add to this. You boil up two cups of water. You add your noodles. You let them cook for two minutes, three minutes. Um, I think three minutes because we don't like hard noodles, but two to three minutes. I like to take a chopstick and stab it in there and jiggle this this wad of curly noodles until they start separating a little bit. I mean, they, but they will, even on their own. So you jiggle them every you know, like sort of stir, but not really stirring. And then you add the flavor packet and stir that in just until it dissolves, which takes seconds or a second. And then, this is what Roy Choi's mother used to do, you slip in an egg, a raw egg, and a pat of butter, meaning a teaspoon of butter. And finally, as the egg is sitting in the hot liquid, uh, in the hot flavored liquid, I don't want to call it broth, um, with, a bit, with a pat of butter, you break in one or even two, I like two, slices of American cheese. So this recipe with two foods that people sneer at, meaning American cheese and the flavor packet of broth, turns out to be an amazing bowl of ramen. Very creamy and rich, of course. It's not low calorie, by the way. I, I, I was sort of horrified when I added up the, added up the numbers. 3,000. Because, because they say these packets of ramen serve two. I don't know who two. Two four-year-olds. Um, two adults, no. So you want to eat a whole packet per person. That's already 300 and whatever calories, uh, almost 400 calories. And then you add an egg for another 80 and a pat of butter for another 30 and two slices of American cheese. It depends. It's gotten up there. So what depends is American cheese is not something I normally buy or eat. But my nephew who has two little girls, two and a half and four and a half, um, he buys uh, American cheese for them as a snack. It's easy. Rip off a piece of cheese. But he buys it from Fresh Direct. And, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if it's sliced to order, but it come, it's not in the package. It's the, whatever brand Fresh Direct has. And I looked it up this morning, and they don't tell you what brand it is. They just tell you, oh, it's, it's really good American cheese. Well, of course they're going to say that. Is it white or yellow? I'm looking. It's white, and it's really good. Well, maybe they have yellow, too, but Brian they buys do. white. Please choose thickness cubing. 
Seriously. From Fresh well, Direct. You know what? They're probably not any different from each other. Anato, A N N A T O, which is a very innocuous coloring coming from a seed. Uh, in, in, in Latino cooking, they use it a lot. To, when you get yellow rice, it's colored with anato. So anyway, um, hmm. I don't I don't care if it's yellow or white, but he buys the white, and I you know ate it for breakfast one morning. It, it's very, very good on hot toast because American cheese melts so easily. And you just put a slice of cheese on your hot toast and it's almost melted and delicious, I thought. Mm-hmm. And But then when I went to make this ramen, I had to go out and buy American cheese and I discovered there's like a zillion brands right. of American cheese. And instead of... I started to read the labels, but instead of reading the labels, I decided, oh, let me start with what most people probably buy, which is craft singles, right. which are individually wrapped. So it, it was okay in the ramen. I wasn't complaining, but when I tasted the cheese on its own, I thought, well, this is horrible. Um, uh, there's reason people are disdainful of American cheese if all they know is, is that, craft it's... singles. So I'm, I'm um, having... I'm just having a moment because I'm reading the description on Fresh Direct of American cheese, and I am okay. one of those people who um, finds Kraft repulsive. Well, the Kraft singles are repulsive. Okay, so this... I agree, and also I, I oh, oh, in this day and age, isn't it such a waste to have plastic, each one wrapped in plastic? Yeah, and I'm sure that I, I wonder how many people forget to take off the plastic, but let that pass. All right. With a deeper flavor, this is from Fresh Direct. With a deeper flavor and texture than most American cheeses out there, our white American cheese just might make your next grilled cheese sandwich, cheeseburger, or tuna melt the best one you've ever had. Yeah, I read that this morning myself. I I, I agree that it is it is excellent cheese for American cheese. It's excellent American cheese. But Amer- I I did a little research on the word American cheese, the name American cheese. Because, of course, we have zillion cheeses in America these days. They're all American cheese. But what we call American cheese uh, is supposed to start out with cheese. It's supposed to be starting out originally, too, with cheddar cheese. And then it is processed, and other other things are added, like um, I'm not going to tell you, actually, because in my search for... Um, something better than Kraft Singles. Now, come on, Arthur, here it is. In my search, I, I went to Whole Foods, actually for meat, because my Whole Foods has great meat at good prices, by the way, too. That's amazing. Um, I found Applegate Organic American Cheese. And the first ingredient in this is organic cheddar cheese. It was This cheese was significantly better than uh, the craft singles. I mean, I would buy. Was it better can. than it's, fresh it's very direct? Expensive though. Um, Applegate so, is, but they're they're. Pardon me. I said Applegate is, but their products because they have Genoa salami. They have a whole range of products that yes, don't have. They do. They have a lot of cold cuts that that don't have bad cheese. stuff in it. So that's well, this only, this only contains cheddar cheese, organic butter, water. Sodium citrate seems to be the preservative of choice. It's even in Kraft Singles. Salt, and the cheese is made with vegetable rennet. Uh, I'm not going to explain that now. Natural rennet is, is, comes from the gut of a lamb. So, um, or sheep, what I mean, or cow. Um, anyway, this organic American cheese as I say, but it's also, I think it, was, it came out to when I figured it out, because it's a five-ounce package, it comes out to like $15 a pound. I mean, that's more expensive than real cheddar cheese. But will real cheddar cheese melt into your ramen as readily as this does? I don't think so. Uh, certainly, I mean, I, I, if you look on, go, if you go to the New York Times cooking um, website, and look up this recipe, uh, uh, Roy Choi's Ramen. I don't know how it's listed, but you'll find it. I did. Um, 
I've made it a zillion times now. And I, I, when I looked at the recipe again this morning, I realized I wasn't really making the full recipe because he garnishes, he's a chef after all, he garnishes it with sliced scallion and sesame seeds. And as many of the commenters pointed out, you can you can doll this up in a lot of ways. You could add a vegetable, for instance, or as as Marshall does, you could use your own broth and not the seasoning packet. But I think that sort of defeats the whole deal here. You know, I used to write, um, I once wrote a column called Two Cans Are Better Than One, the recipes that uh, you just dump things together. This is like that. This is like two, well, the egg. Oh, so the egg, by the way, does not get fully, fully cooked. I have to warn everybody. Even though in, on the New York Times cooking site, it looks like the, the egg has been fully poached, it, it doesn't get fully poached. The, 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 you'll get some cooked white. See, if you only let it sit in the broth for a minute, and I don't like to let it sit much longer than that because I don't want it to get cold. Um, I'd rather have the yolk. You could turn the heat out underneath, or maybe you should add the egg for the last minute of cooking. But if you really want a fully cooked egg, I'm happy to have strands of white and the yolk just thickened. And when you stir it into the hot broth, it it enriches and slightly thickens the broth. Also, the cheese melts instantly. So I want to get back to American cheese for a minute because I think if I served this to you, you'd never in a million years guess that what was enriching it was American cheese. I had two, this reminded me, I had two cases, two incidents in Italy where I didn't know it was American cheese. So what do they call American cheese in Italy? They don't call it American cheese. They're sotilette, which means little thin things. So, or we could say singles, you know, too, the craft singles. These are sotilette, and I think the craft brand started the word sotilette. So I'm eating in, uh, believe me, nowhere Calabria, up in the mountains. And it's a little restaurant run by a husband and wife. She's in the kitchen. He's in the dining room. Uh, people, it's, it's, for people in the, in the know, you're eating Calabrian home cooking. Um, served by a real character. I mean, the man, by the way, he speaks English because he was a he was a waiter and a and whatever captain in in London for years, and he came back to his hometown, turned his his family hovel. <laughs> really, it was a, a really almost a shack. Uh, um, there was a lot of con- new construction going on in this town and around him, condominiums. But he was on his old property, in his old ancestral home. And you expect to have all local food. So we get this plate of sliced potatoes that were uh, each slice fried and then topped with cheese. Oh, it sounds and like it was only most better. Most delicious melted cheese. And Iris was with me. We looked at each other and said, what could this possibly be? Like, we sort of know they're, they're around here, what do they have, Cacciacavallo? No, it ends up, so we say to the owner, what kind of cheese is this? And he says, oh, sotilette, sotilette di craft. <laughs> uh, that sounds so much better. It does. That's <laughs> it does, very fun. That's yeah, very yeah. Fun. Well, this is not the only time this happened to me, <laughs> because, and this recipe is in my book, The Southern Italian Table, a chef friend of mine makes gâteau, which is a Neapolitan festive dish. It's basically, a, a lot of you will know it as potato pie. Uh, in, in America, Italian, Neapolitan Americans made it, even in restaurants. And it's mashed potatoes, usually mixed with cheese and sometimes with bits of salumi, you know, ham or or, or, or a sausage um, in the middle, um, and and then baked in, in, in a breadcrumb lined casserole, and 
my friend makes it in her restaurant, which is very contemporary. Or she makes traditional food that's been contemporized slightly. Sometimes not at all, but presented in a contemporary way. So she makes this gato with sausage and broccoli rob in the middle. And it is so creamy. I say, what? I mean, usually it's mozzarella in the middle, but I knew this wasn't mozzarella. It wasn't stringy. It was just creamy. What is this? My secret ingredient. I said, well, <laughs> you know what it turned out to be. Craft. Saltelette. <laughs> yeah, I wish I liked the taste of saltelette. Well, you would if they were if it yes. was good. So try the Applegate; it's really good. I oh the Applegate, if, even though it's expensive. Or try uh, I don't know does Fresh Dele- Direct deliver in Sharon? I'm sure they do, but that's not. I I, I guess I the, the the whole thing is melting point, and I just I'm so that's right. The whole thing is melting point. I'm I'm I'll, I'll I, wait another twenty degrees for cheddar. Like, I'm glad you brought that up because most people I think. Uh, Restaurants used uh, in the beginning uh, craft slices because they melted so great over over hamburgers or whatever they wanted to put it over broccoli or whatever. It just melted. <laughs> right, exactly. There are di- Most, different cheeses have yeah, different me- like yeah. uh, mozzarella, right. yeah, blah blah blah, melting point. Well, mozzarella is stringy. Yeah, that's true. So you don't uh, you want know, that. Uh, if you want creamy, melty cheese, fontina, and also it's not too uh, aggressive. Right fontina. now, you you raise real fontina from from Italy, not fontina. Well, I, I don't know. There, there's Danish fontina. It, it may be good too. Who knows? I, you know, this is my thing with Swiss cheese. Another cheese that's too maligned, as far as I'm concerned. They, they, it's it's it, technically it's Emmentaler. That's the Swiss cheese with the holes in it. But I have to add. This is intent. People have asked me, how come Swiss cheese doesn't have holes anymore? Well, it does have holes, but it has fewer holes, and that's intentional. Um, I think it has to do with the weight of the wheels, but uh, better for trade. Uh, and, and not all Swiss cheese is made in wheels. Sometimes it's made in those long, um, I don't know, well, how do you describe those long rectangular slabs. whatevers? Pardon me? Slabs, maybe? Slab, I don't know. There's a better word, but I don't know what it is right now. All right. So, um, yeah, in fact, uh, you can't, it's very hard to find real Switzerland Swiss or Emmentaler uh, these days. Um, in fact, I had a, 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 I was in a local supermarket where I'm never going back for various reasons, but this was one where the appetizing guy, although they have all the Boar's Head products, um, which is, I think, really commercial, and I don't usually buy them. Uh, but I do buy the Boar's Head Swiss cheese when I see it. And so I said to the guy, you know, can I have, do you have Boar's Head Swiss cheese? Well, they don't make Swiss cheese. I said, yeah, they do, because I buy it in another store. He says, I don't know, I'll have to ask them. <laughs> so, huh. Anyway. But, so it is hard to find, uh, but Boar's Head does make a decent, mm, it's, Fairly decent one. It's very mild. I like mine much nuttier. But if you want to buy a big hunk of Emmentaler, you can find that. But it's hard to find sliced good cheese. They'll, what they'll give you is either Finlandia, which is made in Finland, obviously, or uh, Jarlsberg, which is made in Norway. And they're decent cheeses, but not the same to me as what? real Switzerland Swiss Emmentaler. Right, and I'm wondering. To me, real Switzerland Swiss Emmentaler has a more 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 tang. But why? Why? Yeah, why nut, a nutty flavor, yeah. really nutty flavor. But why do the Nordic? Um, well, I just think that's interesting that Finland and uh, uh, and Norway are in the the Swiss cheese business. We're not. No, no reason. Good market. I market. You go, uh, you no, go into good, any, good any, weather, any sure. supermarket and ask for Swiss cheese. You're going to get one of those. No, I, I understand. Here, here yeah. it's Finland or, or Jarlsberg. And but, you know, the U.S. is very, very loose uh, about these names. I don't think you can call, for instance, in the wine world, which I know better, uh, you can say Burgundy, you can say Champagne. We have never signed the international treaty that assigns these names to only the geographic area that they're they are. So I mean, Champagne, if it's called Champagne, should be from Champagne, from the region of Champagne, where the wine is closely monitored and regulated, and we know what we're going to get in the bottle. I mean, there are different styles, there's different quality, but 
we know that we're going to get wine, you know, I don't want to go into all the details, but anyway. So in the U.S., we do, in the the good California sparkling wines, call it California sparkling wine. They don't call it champagne. But it's not illegal to call it champagne. And, you know, when I was young and drinking wine for the first time, we used to buy something called Mountain Chardonnay or Mountain Burgundy and Almaden, remember, in the jugs? Yep. Well, that had no relation at all to Burgundy or and I'm not sure the Chardonnay was Chardonnay. Only later did California adopt rules where you named the wine for the variety, the varietal, as they say in the wine world, of, of grape. And then it had to be, I think that still has to be 75% that grape. You're allowed to blend in some other things. The rules may have changed since the last time I looked. These wine rules often do. And then, of course, there are now geographical designations that came later even. But we're still allowed. I mean, you can buy – here's an example. This irritates me no end. If you go into almost any liquor store and ask for Marsala, you're going to buy the number one brand in America, Opichi, which is made in uh, 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 New York State by the Brotherhood Winery. <laughs> and it – You've got to really search for Marsala that is actually made in Marsala and is genuine Marsala. Port and is another one. A lot of American port out there, but it's not port. It's a sweet wine made in America. I don't even know what you'd call it, but it's not port from Portugal. Do you ever like port cheese, where they put port in, in, in Yeah, I can live with it. You know, it, you know, usually the problem is not the port. The problem is the cheese is not the best quality. So if you can get a good quality cheese that's uh, ribboned with port, um, that could be good. But that could be to yummy. Eat, eat, to eat, I would rather be eating the cheese and drinking, drinking the, the port. Yes, right, right, exactly. That's what I thought, yeah. And that's, I'm sure that's where it came from. And somebody thought, well, let's put these two things together. Do you know what right. raises a really interesting topic along the way is if you, how many people you, you line up ten people and you say, okay, where does Marsala come from? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they're not even going to know. It's from Western Sicily. I, and it's from a town called Marsala, <laughs> which, by the way, is a really interesting town um, because it's on the sea. It has the, the, the famous uh, uh, salt flats of Tropani. It's in the province of Tropani. And besides having, because, because it is a winemaking town, they have some good restaurants <laughs> and a very large. Tunisian population because it's a fishing area, and besides that, it was originally um, settled by North Africans. It's now resettled by North Africans, and you get great couscous in Marsala. Mm-hmm. Oh, I want to talk about great couscous the next time. Couscous can... with fish, couscous made with fish. Right, Marshall's shaking his head because he's saying we're out of time. Well, it's eight o'clock. That means I have to get off. All right. We'll miss you. I like. We, we could talk about this. Where, for hours. Go, where am I going? You Actually, you have to get I'm off. going to. Where are where? you going? Yeah, where are you going? I'm going uh, next month. I'm going to New Orleans for a week. Yum. Mm. So I'll broadcast from New Orleans. But I he- I heard your coffee maker earlier. Oh, I did. Do you want to sing da 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 da? Remember that? What, yeah. what, what brand that was, was it? A percolator. What brand was it? It's a percolator. I don't use a percolator. I know, but I'm just trying to. I have one. Nescafe. No. What was it? Is it Maxwell House? I don't know. I don't know. What does that right. have to do with New Orleans? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Very little. Except that New Orleans Commander Palace. Commander coffee. Palace. Coffee with chicory. <laughs> oh, chicory. I, this is nothing I like worse than chicory coffee. All well, right. All right I got, think I'll have like to have less. a cup or two while I'm there. <laughs> right. I've got to regain control here. <laughs> okay. okay, regain control. Right. Happy New Year to those who are celebrating today. If you're not doing anything formal, at least have an apple with some honey. Okay. Or bread with honey. Bread with honey. In my family, by the way, we never had apples. We had bread. Challah with honey. Challah and honey. It's ch- challah. Challah, challah, challah and, and honey. honey. Yeah. Challah and honey. A special uh, uh, round challah for New Year. It's the it, it's it's usually you know Rated. you have an oblong an oval challah, but for New Year for Rosh Hashanah it's round, mm-hmm. symbolizing the uh, endlessness of life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Arthur. Thank you, Rabbi. Happy Schwartz. New Year. Happy New Year. Bye. Bye.
Arthur Schwartz, the food maven here on The Breakfast Club on Robin Hood Radio. Underwriting support for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven from Hathaway Young, located on South Center Street in Millerton, Flawless Catering and Event Planning, HathawayYoung.com. John Andrews Restaurant on the Hillsdale Road in South Egremont, 413-528-3467, on the web, jarestaurant.com. Rubiner's Cheesemongers and Grocers on Main Street in Great Barrington, 413-528-0488, Rubiner's.com. In Hillsdale, New York, Hillsdale Home Chef with two beautiful teaching classes, and they've got classes to go in those cooking rooms. More information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com. And Haven Cafe in Lenox, Massachusetts, offering quality food and excellent service. Run a fresh cup of great coffee to healthy, delicious breakfast or sit down with a dinner with a tasty, life-enhancing meal that you can take home. Also, they feature catering. Supporting local organic farmers, environmentally conscious, and epicurious distributors, havencafebakery.com. <laughs> 